A little bit of housekeeping real quick. We've discovered recently that this database does not like Internet Explorer. So if you're using a browser, we recommend you not use Internet Explorer, but stick to Firefox or Chrome or something other than Internet Explorer. And that's not really crucial so much as it becomes apparent toward the end of the session. Sometimes it won't do what you ask it to do when you bring up some of the visualizations and some of the um, more memory heavy features that we do a little bit later in the session. It may have issues with those if you're using IE. Not always, just on occasion. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and whoops, me here. bring up uh, the library homepage. Just to start off with, I want to take you to a guide that we've created about Scopus to give you a little bit more information about what's in it and what's not. If you're on the library homepage, in the center of the page, there is a link called Guides. If you go ahead and click on that, and then in the search box, just type the name of the database, Scopus. It will take you to some results, and that results, the very first one, should have the word Scopus clearly labeled. Okay, if anybody needs me to repeat that, let me know. Sometimes it's a little tricky to talk and watch at the same time. The reason I wanted to show this guide is simply because uh, it has some nice uh, visual information on it about the database. And basically, Scopus is a large database. The company would like you to believe it's the largest database of its kind. They like to huff and puff. It is a very large database, however. Um, and one of the main features of this database is what I mentioned before, that you can analyze and visualize some of the information in graphs. Um, it's also really intended to be a competitor to the web of science, if you're familiar with that database. When it, the company that created Scopus said, we want to directly compete with it and we want to do better at what they do. So it is a competitor. Um, the main feature of this, why you would want to use this database versus another, is it does really well at international journals. It does really well at covering non-English language journals. And it covers interdisciplinary areas really well. And that's an area, all three of those are areas that a lot of our other databases just really fall down on and they can't uh, cover very well. Is that a question? Yes, yeah, so the question was, do journals have to apply to actually get their content in Scopus? Um, on the right side of this screen, you'll see journal selection criteria. Scopus is pretty broad, but their criteria mainly has to be, it has to be peer-reviewed journals. They don't usually have to apply to get in there. Scopus is out there scrolling, trying to find those journals. If you know of one that's not in there, they'd be happy to know about it. But their criteria on the right are, are their key ones, and that is it has to have an English abstract if it's not an English language journal. And that cuts a lot of people out right there. Um, it has to have at least an issue a year, and it has to be peer-reviewed. So that's pretty broad. If you stop and think about all the journals that exist out there, Web of Science really is trying to focus on the core journals in each discipline. So it's a much smaller group of journals than what Scopus is trying to cover. Great question. Thank you. OK, I'm going to scroll down so you can see a little bit more visually about Scopus, what they think it covers. This comes directly from the Scopus website, uh, talking about what their, journal cover, what their coverage is. They originally started out to compete with Web of Science. They were strongly science. They were strongly life science, specifically. They got a lot of criticism over that. This is their 10-year anniversary this year. And a couple of years into production, they said, whoops, we need to go back and cover a lot more social sciences and humanities areas. And so you can see social sciences here is a good segment, but it's still only about a fourth of the database. Having said that, I really encourage you to play around with your subjects as we go along in the database today, because that'll give you a better feel for what's actually in the database, and what you can find or can't find on your individual subjects. Uh, you'll be able to see that for yourself. If you scroll just a little bit further down, what I was talking about earlier, the international scope uh, of this database is really broad. And they do really well, obviously, at Western Europe coverage, um, as well as the North American. North American is only about a third of the coverage that they're doing in the database. I'm going to scroll back up here, and on the tab that says Comparison, 
Um, I've written out for you exactly what we've sort of talked about so far. If you're really interested in comparing the databases, there's some links on the left, but I think what will be most of interest to you is what's in the middle of the page about which database should you use for which purpose. It talks a lot about the strengths and weaknesses of Google Scholar versus Web of Science. Um, if you're doing a uh, discipline that has a lot of book coverage, Google Books does this really well. So Google Scholar is going to cover books really well. These other databases also have some scholarly book coverage, but not nearly as much. If you're in a book discipline, you probably want to be using Google Scholar a little bit more. And peer-reviewed journals, that's the where Google Scholar uh, is on the weak side. They do cover peer-reviewed journals, but they also cover a lot of other junk that they find on the internet that they think is on a scholarly website. So just because you're finding it in Google Scholar does not mean it's a peer-reviewed publication. Okay, that's a lot to fit into your brain all of a sudden here. Do you have any questions so far about what's in Google Scholar or what you think is in Google Scholar at this point versus what's in Scopus? No questions, okay. Um, also on this guide, uh, there's a tab labeled training. For those of you who didn't bring your own topics today, you want to have some sample topics you can play with, we've put a few up here for you, either for authors or for topics, different things that you can actually go ahead and copy and paste, search into your search boxes if you want to, if you don't already have a topic that you came in in mind with to search. We know they work. We've tried them in the database. Okay, um, with that, uh, if there's no other questions, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Jesse, and he's going to talk about actually running some searches and how you get into it. Okay, uh, so to get to Scopus, um, I guess we're there already, uh, what you can do is start the library website once again. And if you click on the Article Indexes and Databases link, uh, there are several ways you can get there. Um, if we, since we know we're going to Scopus, you can just type Scopus into the, the search box here. Um, or you could just click on the S in the alphabetical list and choose from that. All right, so uh, this will look a lot like a lot of other uh, databases that are out there. Um, you know, a basic box for what you want to search for and the ability to choose what sort of thing you're looking for. The default is just the article title, the abstract, and keywords, so it's just a general search. Um, if you have specific information for a specific article, you can, uh, you know, talk about just the author or just the title um, and add more search fields to uh, specify different parts. Uh, just to do a general search here, I'm going to do a one for graph theory to get to a results list. Um, top left, it gives us how many documents. This one found over 93,000, which is a lot to sort through. Um, basic list of results it defaults to 20 per page. You can increase that if you want to be able to scroll through more things without having to hit next. As in a lot of other databases or resources you might be familiar with, we have the ability to refine your search results on the left side here. Uh, so let's say we want to restrict uh, this 93,000 document search um, by things that were just published in 2012 and were in computer science as opposed to other uh, topics. And let's say we just want to use uh, uh, journal articles. So now we're down to just over, uh, just under 11, 1,100. Um, and you can use, you can continue to refine on, on the left side here. You can choose specific things you want to exclude instead of limiting to what you do want. Uh, same thing, just check the, the options and then click on limit or exclude. You can search within the search results uh, to find further uh, narrowed topics. Um, the, the list of results has some, inter some useful information there. 
a lot of times we'll have this view at publisher link. If it's a, available uh, through one of our subscriptions, this one didn't, didn't seem to find it. Let's try a different one. It's, it might take you to a different uh, different vendor. So it's that we're no longer on a, on Scopus. We're in some other publisher's website. Um, it might ask you for payment information if we don't subscribe to it. I'm trying to find one that we do have though. So cases like this where we just have the full text PDF available, it'll be somewhere on that page. Um, alternately, we can always use the handy get it at ISU button to bring up uh, the library's, uh, why isn't that going anywhere? Generally that will try to find, it'll either direct you, direct, uh, send you directly to the page that has the, uh, the PDF available or to an intermediary page like this one. Uh, for example, we don't have the full uh, full text available for this article, um, but it will give you the option to link directly into inter interlibrary loan to find it that way. If we click into the full record, we have a lot more information. Uh, a lot of things are, are available as links, so we can click here to search for other things that are in the same journal as this article. Um, it tells you volume and issue information and uh, page ranges. So if you're uh, trying to cite it, um, that information is all available. Generally, there are there's author information, um, often even with with their uh, affiliation, so you know where they're doing their work. And those are also links where you could do a search based on that name. Abstract in English, as as Lori pointed out. Um, author keywords, which are assigned by the authors. So that's not controlled vocabulary vocabulary. That's just what they want to, text they want to have uh, tied to their articles. Then also the indexed keywords, which would be assigned by uh, Scopus. Um, so I searched for graph theory and that's where this one came in. Uh, we also have um, uh, the cited documents, or cited by documents. So over on the right, we have the list of other articles that have cited this article since its publication. Um, much like Web of Science, so it's very handy to be able to uh, click back and forth through things that, um, that are, are related in that way. Go back. Not sure why this record's reloading something. Give it a moment. Sorry about this. All right. So again, you click into one of them. I'm trying to show that. In many cases, they'll also have a list of the documents that are cited by the article down here at the bottom. I'm not sure why none of the ones I'm clicking into have any listed. Yeah, hang on. It might be, yeah. And it looks like it's done loading. All right, I'm not sure what is wrong with, with this browser right now. Generally, below the information for this article, there'll be a, a list similar to the a search results uh, list um, of the, article, the articles that th these people uh, cited in the article you're, you're, you're looking at. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, moving on. Um, so let's say you have a list of articles that you want to keep. You want to use them in your work. You want to refer to them later. You just want to uh, 
say the citations. Uh, it's fairly simple. You just use the check boxes um, next to the uh, the article uh, citation. Um, you can select a whole page at once with the, the button up here at the top. Um, and even if you uh, click through to another page, or if you run a separate search entirely, it should keep track of how many items you have checked total. Um, and I don't know why I'm having trouble finding that too. All right, I'm having trouble finding it. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, um, oftentimes when you click into an, an item, over on the right below the, the number of cited by documents, we'll also have related documents uh, where you can um, click on, say, keywords to find other documents that have a similar set of keywords assigned to them. Um, or you can click into the authors to see other things uh, where it's, it's, you know, similar authors. It might not necessarily be the, the same individual authors, but uh, the same people working together. So that can be handy. All right. So, all right, so I can't find how to find all, this, all the things I've checked. But if I find, if I check all the things I want, um, how many people in the room are using uh, bibliographic management software? like EndNote or Mendeley. OK. Um, this is how you would use those in conjunction with this. So you have, hmm? uh, yeah, you could use it for that too. Um, so you have the, the things you want. And you hit click on the export link. And you have the option to have a couple of them. If you use Mendeley or, or RefWorks, you can send it directly to those. Um, or you can choose from a couple other options. So yes, BibTeX if you're using um, a, a LaTeX editor. Um, but the RIS format is the one that we would want to use for EndNote. And uh, I'll give that a particular plug because EndNote is the one of these that we directly support in the library. Um, so uh, at the end of the month, on, on the 31st, we are running a, an EndNote web workshop as well. Um, so if you have any interest in that, uh, look for those signups to go up soon. Uh, you can choose how much information you want to include, just the citation. Do you want the abstracts? Do you want uh, all the referenced uh, citations as well? And just click on export. I don't think so. I'm in Firefox. But Firefox. <laughs> It, it's it's Firefox. I don't know what the deal is. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with this computer. Yeah, this this might I'm there we go. Okay, so it's it's giving me the option to save the file. Um, and once you have it, uh, if you're using a program that recognizes that, including EndNote or Mendeley, most, most bibliographic management systems will recognize the RIS format. And then you can just go into its uh, controls and then import that file, and that should include all of your, all your citations. So despite the problems I'm having with this, does anyone have any questions about what I've gone over? No? Um, yeah, yeah. Hopefully it'll work better for whoever is running that one. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's it for me then. Uh, next I'm going to hand it off to Megan who will go over running author searches and then some other uh, altmetrics information.
Okay, so I'm here and I'm going to talk about author searches. Author search, the button for it is right next to document search. So once you're on the main search page, you want to make sure you click author search. The layout changes a little when you do this. And you'll see you have a couple more field boxes. You have search by author last name next to it, initial or first name, affiliation, and underneath that is ORCID ID, which I'll go into a little bit. There are a couple of main reasons to do author searches. So if, for example, you have a colleague who suggests looking up an author but doesn't remember the year of the, or only remembers the year of the paper they want you to read but doesn't remember the name of the paper, doing an author search can really help you narrow down what you're looking for. When author search doesn't work very well is when it's a very common name, such as a last name of Smith, first initial A. There are literally thousands of people named A. Smith. But if you can combine a name with where they work, that is when author search really excels. So for example, if you search Iowa State authors, you know they're at Iowa State. If you put just the word Iowa in affiliation, along with their last name, first initial, you're more, much more likely to find the people you're looking for. So adding that little bit really helps. So I'm going to just do a quick demonstration about what I meant about what it's good at and what it's bad at. So I mentioned A. Smith. Ooh, that's a lot of authors. There's almost 9,000 people with that. And one of the things it tells you at the top is Scopus assigns unique identifiers to groups of people, or groups of documents that think are authored by the same people. And it clusters them. Sometimes it's really good at this. Sometimes it puts the wrong publication under the wrong person because the name is very similar. If you do detect an error, you can actually report it to them. But in general, it's not that bad. So A. Smith, not an excellent search because there's lots of A. Smiths. But if I limit it to, say, A. Smith at Princeton, or actually, let's do Arizona. I only have 85 instead of eight, over 8,000. So I've narrowed it down to just a slice of that giant bunch I was looking through. So author search can be really handy if you only have part of the information. Maybe you want to look up something your colleague wrote. Maybe you're the author. You want to see your documents, your citations, things like this. So on our guide page, which I think we still have it open. Oh, I think I may have restarted the browser with the guide. So let me quickly bring it back up. Okay, so now we're back on the guide. Under the training tab, there's something that says author. And we actually have an Iowa State author on here that has a very unique name. And so it's a perfect author search, and it shows when author search works really well. So if you want to copy it and follow along, I can show you some neat features of the author search. Once again, you want to make sure you're in the author search, otherwise you won't see the same fields. So the last name goes in the first box, and the first initial or first name goes in the second. Because um, this person has a unique name, I'm actually not going to put in an affiliation, because I think I don't need to, but we'll see. Turns out there is only one person with this last name and first initial, so it worked OK. Once you go into their record, it will tell you that a whole bunch of statistics about that author. You get how many documents they've written that are in this database. There may be documents missing. You also get how many different citations and how many different documents have cited this person. You can also see something kind of neat, which is a list of co-authors who they've worked with by clicking the co-author button. And it brings up a list. When you hover over the number, you can see how many different, and then click it, you can actually get the list of documents that they've co-authored with. So Scopus is really nice, and I like it because it has all these built-in features that are a little bit hidden, but they're pretty natural once you start exploring. So this is one example of one of those kind of hidden but very nice features. Another thing to keep in mind is that it will put, 
it will automatically sort by newest first. So it's going to look like this first one that just came out has zero citations. You might think that's really bad. Well, you have to remember the lag period for citations. This just came out this year. It's going to take probably a year or so for it to be cited. The same thing is reflected in the chart on top. It looks like they're really low the last couple years, but it's a two to three year citation lag, sometimes more depending on the field you're in. So when you look at these statistics, make sure you understand them. And so in this case, the number of citations should go up by how old the document is as well. You can also sort by amount cited. So for example, instead of by date, now I have the ones that are cited the most to least. This is going to be a different order because it's going to be like importance of work instead of date it was made. So, Another thing I want to go over that I think I skipped talking about is when you do an author search, let's do one of our other training names. Let's do Bushman. Oh no wait, I had a different one that was better for this. Yeah, we'll just do Bushman. And we'll just do B. It tells you that there are 17 author results and it's displaying the first nine of them. What it also has is this little thing where it hides some information where it says show profile matches with one document. That means if you have some Bushmans, it hasn't, for example, doesn't know that, you know, it was Bushman Barbara versus Bushman James B. It doesn't put those in those clusters, so it's hiding them by default. So if you're not seeing the person you're looking for, sometimes pushing this button will give you more results. In this case, it's actually showing me all 17 results, not just the top nine now. So there's some that weren't in that first set. It also is going to sort them by the number of citations, meaning probably the most cited authors, not alphabetically. So if you have Bushman A, B, C, you just search for Bushman, the A's aren't going to be on top. It's going to be by whichever Bushman has the most citations, not alphabetical. So something to keep in mind. So if you've just published, you're probably going to have to scroll down a little bit to actually find your stuff when you do an author search. It's just the way it weighs it in the results. Before I go on, does anyone have any questions about the basics of author searching? Okay. We'll wait and make sure everyone online is good too. Okay. So, we're going to go ahead and open Brad's profile. And make sure everything loads, which it did. So one of the nice things in here also, and you'll actually see these little flags throughout Scope, is that if there's an article in press, it flags it with this bright orange article in press flag. That's kind of nice. That way you know, you know, the citation exists. Is this forthcoming? I may not be able to get it now, but I can wait and like wait a few months and get it later. Lori's actually going to talk about how you can keep track of things like this in a bit. Another thing you can do, which is cool, is see which subject areas Scopus is, is assigning these authors. So in this case, this person is assigned psychology, social science, and a few more if I say view more. Oh, all sorts of stuff. So if you do cross-disciplinary research, you're actually going to be put in different slots of Scopus. It can be kind of neat to see, example, what areas your research might be influencing if you're looking up yourself. It may also show you that Scopus doesn't know how to really sort some of these articles into the right categories, depending on who you're looking at. So the next thing I want to talk about is all, the alt metric things that are built into Scopus, which I think is really neat. And I, to do that, I'm going to do the cited by search. And the alt metrics are really only going to work best for articles that are newer, probably 2010 on definitely 2012 on. So we're going to look for an article that fits that time frame. And this one. So at first I'm not seeing the alt metrics, but if I scroll down, they should load. 
Oh, it's not loading. Let's try forcing the page to reload. There, there it is. Alt metric for Scopus. Oh, okay, so you can force a page reload on your browser by pushing F5. Sometimes I think there's a control that we're not seeing where Scopus says it took too long to get those results. We're not going to show you all the information so you get your stuff faster. But if you really want that extra information, try force refreshing your browser by pushing F5. So if you don't see alt metrics, there's either two things. There are no alt metrics for that article, which the older it is, the more possible that is. Or Scopus had a hiccup and you need to force it to reload. So. So now we're at the grand question of what are alt metrics. We're actually going to do a workshop on this later in the semester, but alt metrics are a different way of measuring article impact or reach. So normal citations is how we've been doing this. You know, the more it's cited, the better the impact. But alt metrics captures impact of things beyond articles. We're talking about databases, code, poster presentations, conferences, things like that. It also covers traditional articles, though, and since Scopus is an article database primarily, it works in this as well. If you look at the alt metrics, you can see eight science blogs looked at, covered this article. One Google user wrote a comment. Seven news outlets also covered it, things like that. If you want more information, you can click on it. And it will give you a bit more information about what happened. So, for example, I know now that Popular Science covered it. CNN covered it. Oh, if I scroll down, there's CNN. So this can be kind of a nice way of seeing your reach of your article beyond just the academic world. No other database that we have right now that I know of does this. So if you're interested in this, this can kind of be a shortcut if you're interested in these kind of statistics. So. Yes? What is Mendeley? Okay, so EndNote is the Thomson Reuters bibliographic management tool for citation. Mendeley is the Elsevier version. So if you use Scopus a lot, Mendeley is going to be a bit, they make it easier to use in Scopus because they own it. The same way EndNote's easier to use if in Web of Science. So any other questions? We can use general questions too. Okay. Oh yeah, that's right. So Jesse was trying to get this to show. Once you're inside an article, if you want to see what references they are citing in the article, we'll provide you a list. If they have over 80 references, which this one doesn't, it only has 79, you'll actually have to click a button that says show more. So if you're looking at a review article, for example, that cites 400 something articles, you need to click show more to see all 400 references. So that's a good point, Jesse, thanks. And I think we're going to go over and turn it over to Lori for the last part of the presentation. Okay, one last call for questions before we sort of switch gears a little bit here. Everybody fuzzed over a little bit with all the capabilities that this thing can do, because we're going to give you a few more. I, I love and hate this database. It has so many things that are hidden that if you don't think to look there, you may not notice it. I, I want to go back to the search results real quick and point out that, oh, this one doesn't have it. Shouldn't matter. I don't have an export button. Yeah, oh, I know why. Duh. Thank you. Um, we should actually have to click on the back to get that Okay. Actually, what I'm, I'm going to leave that search because I need a. Sorry, I'm backing up too far. Never mind. I'll just do a different topic. Um, if you've got a topic and you can find just about anything on frogs, it's one of my favorite searches. Every database has frogs in it, and it gave me the results. What was your code? Oh, thank you. Always helps to have co-authors keep me in shape. Okay. Okay, when you're in a database and you see some that you like, and 
Jesse mentioned this earlier, I think, that you can mark particular ones that you like. When you do this, you have a feature up above where you can export life is good, okay? You can collect some of those things as you go along. However, one of the other things that you can do is to save or to set an alert for your topic. Up at the top here in the middle is this set alert button. If this is your main research field and you want anything new that pops out in the literature on this topic, click on set alert and it will notify you every time something new is added to the database on this topic. Now, here's the trick. It has to know who you are. So you have to log in to use this feature. Okay? Um, if you don't, if you're not logged in and you click on set alert, what you get is a page asking you to log in and it gives you the option. If you're not logged in on the right, it says register now. Like a lot of other things, it's free. Um, just go ahead and click on it and register if you're interested in that. It does the usual, make you verify it on your email to prove it's a valid account kind of thing. But once you've done that, you have many more options. Hold on just a sec here. Oh, it remembers me. That's so nice of it. Whoops. Um, I'm, I have had an account for ages, um, but I keep changing my mind about what I want uh, in my uh, alerts. Um, so I'm logged in, and if you click on alerts, once you're logged in, it will show you the three possible alerts you have. You can do a search alert, which is what I just did. Pick your topic, however convoluted or basic you want that topic to be is up to you and save on that search results page, save your alert. Um, you have the option for frequency to do every two months, you can do every six months, you can do weekly, you can do daily. It's whatever you want to set that toggle at within some limits. They have some preset limits that you can set it at. You can do the same sort of thing for author citation alerts. If your major professor or your coworker has written an article and you want to know every time that article has been cited in the current literature that's in this database, set an alert for it and it will send you an email every time someone cites that particular article. The third kind is a document, oh, I did it backwards, my bad. Document citation is the one I just mentioned, which is if you know of a particular article that you want to be alerted about. Author alert is any time that author has written something new. Anytime something is added to the database by that author, with them as the author, then you'll get that. They don't have to be the first author, they can be the 16th author, but anytime a publication is added to the database by that author, you get an email saying, oh look, they wrote something new. You wanted to know about this, here's your link, and it directly gives you a link to the publication within Scopus. At any point you can log in and you can edit and change your mind. You can say, eh, I was interested in this, but I'm going to make this one go inactive because I just lost my grant. <clears throat> okay? You can keep it there. You don't have to reconstitute it ever. It can just stay there. Or you can actually delete it completely if you're not interested in keeping it there. Okay? So this can give you an idea of some of the alerts that you can do within the system. So anytime you've got search results on your page, of one sort or another, whether it's an author search or a document search, look for that set alert button up near the top because that's what's going to key you in to be able to save that to your account. Questions about alerts? Quite a group today. Okay. Um, one of the other uh, features that we haven't done much yet is an analyze feature. And actually, let me go back and run a new search because I want to add a little bit more to it here. Whoops. Okay, this is going to be a little bit smaller set, which is why I added to it. Um, there are limits to search sizes in the database. I don't remember what all of them are, but if you hit it, it will tell you. Don't worry. If your search is too big for it to do something with, it will let you know that. It's a pretty generous limit. 
Web of Science has the same sort of thing, and I've got those memorized, but not Scopus yet. We haven't played around as much with it. In the mid, so after you've got your search, notice before I mentioned the set alert button right here in the middle is where you set your alert. Just below it is an analyze search results feature. And what this does is all the fancy charts that we were talking about earlier. And that is you can, it's looking at all the, the 601 documents in my results set and it's letting me know some things about it. The default is to show you by year, how many of those documents were published each year. By using the tabs, you can change it to say, let's see what universities or which organizations are publishing those articles. If you want to see who is doing research in this area, if this is your major field of research, and you want to see what other institutions are doing the same research, this is your way to find that. The same sort of thing for author. You can see which of the authors in the set have published the most, most articles on that topic based on the search that you input. You can, there are many more than it's displaying. It's just they tend to figure most people are only going to be interested in the top ones. So that's what it's displaying on the right are the top ones in the set. For any one of those, if you mouse over the number, let's say I like, I, I happen to know Bill Duhlman is a cool researcher, and I want to see those 19 articles on my topic written by that person. So you've jumped from the chart of the heavy users into looking at the results from that search. And it's only paired your, set, your search results down to just show that one author that you just clicked on. And I, I start worrying about losing people at this point because you start clicking around and it's kind of fun to play with and get lost in pretty easily. Um, I, some of these don't really make sense. Some of the tabs I'm not really as enamored with. Document type is kind of a worthless one in my opinion simply because this is mostly a journal article database. Yeah, there's a few other things like books. There's a few other things like conference proceedings and patents, but the vast majority of your search results are going to be journal articles. So document type is probably not as uh, fun to play with. If you have an interdisciplinary subject, this is kind of cool because if this is your research field, you can show that the articles being published on this topic are published in this expanse of research disciplines. It's not just slotted into this one narrow subject field. Um, I don't know if you noticed up at the top of the chart, there's also this date range. When you are analyzing search results, it tells you what the time period is that's covered in that set. This database was created 10 years ago. They were doing, at the time, 1997 to the present. Since then, they've gone back and added in a lot more data, a lot more journals, and a lot more older articles. So this particular topic has articles in the database that go back to 1948. That will change depending on your topic and what they can find on your topic in the database. If you really only wanted to look at the recent ones, scroll down using the drop down and say, oh, I really only want to see the ones since 2000 and let's analyze those instead because what if that author I was interested in retired 20 years ago? Maybe that shouldn't be the person that I'm taking a look at. So now if you go back to look at author, Bill Duhlman is still there, but he's only got 12 instead of the larger number that he had before. So the most recent articles being written in this database, the, the author with the most number of articles on this topic is this particular, ooh, I love it when it does that. This is what I meant by every now and then the database has a mind of its own. You click on something and it doesn't want to do it. It takes you back to the search page. Just use the, back, the browser button to go back to where you were at. Okay, um, that is analyze results by topic. Um, up in the upper right corner you have some options. Because these have some very lovely graphs, um, if you're a researcher in this area and you're this first author, you might want to be able to display this as part of your promotion file. Look, I've written the most articles in the database on this topic. If you want to do that, you probably want to use this export feature in the upper right-hand corner. This is something some of our other databases cannot do. Usually they make you screen print. You usually can't download the data either. And in this case, you have many options. To export the data, um, it's usually, I recommend the CSV file if you're going to be importing it into Excel. It actually gives you the raw data uh, when you're going to do that sort of thing. So depending on which page you're on, your export features 
can be different. Sometimes it will let you download the chart itself and the page as it is, and other times it only lets you do the data behind the page. At any point, you have the option, obviously, to do a screen capture as well. And they do print out very nicely. This is um, one of the pie charts that I did earlier. It's kind of small. I recommend if you're going to be printing from this database that you print color because black and white of these beautiful bar graphs doesn't mean anything in a black and white print. And I also recommend you use a landscape feature on your printer if you're going to do that. Okay, one more kind of result that I think a lot of people want to try and do. Let's go back to the search screen and this time do an author search. You can pick on one of the ones you did before if you want. And I like to pick on uh, Brad Bushman here because I know he's got a large set and it makes it fun. So, if this is the author you really like, go ahead and check it and click on View Citation Overview. This is that question we got earlier about what's View Citation Overview do. It, it only functions for authors and it's going to bring up their scholarly record as this machine understands it, all of the content within Scopus by that author and it's going to analyze it for you and let you create some reports. So the most popular one we talked about a little bit earlier is all of their citations. The default here is to show citations from 2010 through 2014. Um, and notice it's set to citation count descending. Uh, pardon me, the, the default viewing at the moment is date newest, but you can change it to see which ones are being cited the most. And it reorders them on the screen for you. Just like before, you have date range possibilities here. Um, and also export possibilities. And when you do export, notice it just automatically downloaded it as a CSV file. It didn't give me any options. Okay, So it really just depends on which page you're on as to what your options are. You can also save the documents. If you're logged in, you can save this list to your own account, like you could save the author or the articles earlier. Um, again, remember you can change the date. Anytime you see a date range, click on the drop down and you can change the date range if you'd rather see anything from 2007 and just click on the update and you'll see something a little different. Okay. Um, I also want to go back and show you because, oh, I love, I love databases when they don't. Work right. Hold on here. I'm back. When you were looking at an author screen, you also had a lot of other capabilities. Notice that view citation overview is also available from this main author page in the center. But you also have the feature to analyze the author output. This is another one of those cool fun reports that looks kind of glitzy. Oh, sorry about that. We lost audio for the online folks. I think we're back now. Thank you for thank you for asking. So when we're looking at an author and we clicked on back up one more to show you. We clicked on analyze author output in the middle of the screen. The default is to show you by journal, their output. Notice it says by source right here under 147 documents. You can change this to say you want to see it by year. Did it do it again? No, you stopped sharing the screen. See the code again. Okay. Sorry about that. 
even though you have these four tabs at the top here that talk about documents, age indexations, and co-authors, below it you have some other options. And one of mine that I really like is by year, but also by subject area. Again, if you're in one of those interdisciplinary areas and this is your research output, these are all the articles your one author has put out, you can see this one author is writing in a huge range of disciplines, even though they are a psychologist, they are still publishing in this wide range of subject area. And the other reason I like to show this is because it does have quite a bit of social sciences in here. Um, none of our citation databases do a really strong job of covering social sciences and humanities, but this one does try to do it a little bit better than some of the other ones. So I encourage you to just sort of play around with some of the tabs. Uh, anytime you're sitting on the author screen, take a look around. There are, they hide so much stuff in this interface because they're trying to put so much content onto the one page for you um, that it becomes hard to see sometimes that you have all of these individual options. So one of my goals by showing you some of these is that you'll remember, oh, wait a minute, I know there's a way. I saw it on the screen. Now how do I do it? And we can help you figure out which feature it was that provided that kind of chart. Questions about the reports that we've looked at or at any of the author analyzing features? Okay. Um, the one last thing that I want to show you is back on the search screen. And up to now, most of the content we've been providing we're aiming at, because we know our mixture of our audience here is probably a combination of grad students and faculty and staff. Yes, was that a question? Uh, can you exclude self-citations? You can exclude self-citations. That was a great question. When you were looking at the author screen, um, you're viewing the citation overview. There are these options on the right to exclude the self-citation either of the author's page that we're looking at, which is Brad Bushman, or all of the, the people they've co-authored with. Um, but notice you can only do them one at a time. And click on Update. And the chart changes. Now I've got 147 documents. OK? So by the way, can this be done on the Yes. Um, you can exclude self-citations from any cited reference database that we have, including, um, let me think about that, yes. I had to stop and think about that for a second. I have a handout on the library guides. There is a guide on cited reference searching. And on one of those, there is a link out to separate documents that walk you through step by step of how to exclude self-citations from each of those individual databases. It's not easy in some of them, but it can be done. This one, they try to make it easy for you by putting it on the author screen. Great question. OK, so back on the home page, essentially the home page for Scopus, if you will. We've been playing with the search boxes all this time. And there are many more features where you really don't have time to do all of them. I don't know if you noticed, but it was keeping track down below here of the other steps that we were looking at. And if you wanted to go back, you could just click on it to go back to one of the earlier sets that we were working at. So if you lose track of where you're at, you can always go back through that little search history feature that we have at the bottom. Okay. You can also, up on the right here, notice uh, browse sources and compare journals. Um, when people want to know how much of my discipline is in this database, some of the easiest ways to do that is look at the journals that it covers. So I'm going to click on Compare Journals. Um, mostly this tends to be faculty who are um, uh, tenure track that are interested in this. But let's say you're doing, uh, I'm going to pick on psychology because I can't type it, P-S-Y-C-H-O-L-O-G-Y, uh, as a keyword in the journal name. Um, when it comes up with results, it found 241 journals that have the word psychology in the title of it somewhere. If you find the ones you want to compare, click next to it 
and watch what happens on the right side of the screen. It compares several features of those journals as part of a graph. And you can add multiple lines. Whoops, I picked one that's a fairly new journal. Let me go back up higher. And then above the graph are these tabs, including looking at citations. If you want to see which journals have the higher citation rate, that's what this chart is telling you. You want to see which journals have more documents published per year. That's what this one is telling you if you're clicking on documents. So this is kind of a fun way to play around with. If you can't decide which journal you want to publish in, look up a couple of the journals that you're thinking about and compare them using the compare journals feature. The other thing it does, um, and I'm not going to go in a lot of detail about this, but a lot of people ask about impact factors of journals. This is the scopus version of an impact factor. Impact factor is actually copyrighted by the people who do Web of Science. But what they do here is something called SNP, which is normalized impact per paper and also a Simago journal rank per year. So if you're interested in journal impacts, this database can do that for you, but in a slightly different way. Okay, that's all we have for content. Do you have any questions at this point about things we've asked, not asked? Um, life is good. We're all confused and happily playing away in the database at this point. Okay. Um, you picked up an evaluation form when you came in. If you would, please remember to fill that out. And those who are doing this online, we have also loaded an, a copy of it online for you to use. Susan, have they already gotten a link for that? Okay. And we have um, on the guide, before I forget, let me jump back to the Scopus guide real quick. On the last tab of the Scopus guide is an in-person help. This is our contact information. If you have more questions about any of this as you're actually working through Scopus, feel free to give us a holler. Um, Jesse specializes in the EndNote aspects and downloading. Megan, obviously, the altmetrics, which she talked about a little bit, as well as data management. And I tend to do a lot with the other cited reference databases. So any one of us, give us a whirl. If you uh, want help, we're willing to come to your workstation and help you actually compose searches if you're having trouble or just help you navigate through it either at your office or here in the library is up to you. Okay, well thank you for coming.